Now that we've talked about the non-avian reptiles, let's spend some time talking about the avian reptiles or birds. Birds belong to class aves, and some modern day bird um, examples include hummingbirds, penguins, ostriches, pigeons, cardinals, flamingos, kiwi birds, um, the list goes on and on and on. For the most part, um, you probably can identify a bird when you see one. And this is because they have a variety of very unique characteristics that set them apart from any other animal living on earth today. And we'll talk about some of those characteristics over the next few slides. All modern day birds fit within two categories, paleognathy and neognathy. Now both of these terms are actually referring to the structure of the palate and the mouth of the bird, and we won't go into detail on those, but it's important to know that most flightless birds belong to paleognathy. And these birds are flightless because they have a flat sternum and poorly developed pectoral muscles. So they're not really designed for flight and they're not able to produce enough uh, force when flapping to facilitate flight. And then neognathy are most of our flight uh, enabled birds. And they have a keeled sternum and powerful flight muscles, so powerful pectoral muscles that allow them to be structurally um, optimized for flight as well as produce enough power to flap their wings to fly. And some examples include owls, blue jays, and hummingbirds. But not all birds that belong to the group Neognathy are able to fly. Um, there are some flightless birds like penguins. And flightlessness is actually something that has uh, been seen to evolve over and over within birds. Um, so it's not a homologous character. It's an analogous one where many species over time have developed flightlessness. Um, and then, of course, we have our uh, paleognathy include the ostriches, emus, and kiwis, which are the biggest group of flightless birds alive today. Birds have a four-chambered heart, like their closely related uh, uh, relative crocodilians and then um, like mammals as well. And they're, like mammals, they're also endotherms, so they can regulate their body temperature internally. They don't have to worry about um, using environmental um, conditions to regulate their body temperature. Feathers are a key detail of birds. Um, they're one thing that makes them very unique. And feathers are actually homologous to reptilian scales. And feathers initially evolved for thermal regulation purposes in early dinosaurs. But then over time, these, uh, these feathers that were uh, designed for insulation then in dinosaurs that were symmetrical became asymmetrical and adapted for flight. And so we'll talk about different um, structures of feathers and different types of feathers in the next slide. And then of course, wings are another key character of uh, birds. And these wings are modified forelimbs. And so we'll also take a look at the structure of the forelimbs that make up the wings in uh, the next couple of slides. Another key characteristic of birds that allows them the ability to fly is their pneumatic skeleton. So their bones are far more lightweight than let's say our bones or um, non-avian reptilian bones because they have a lot more porous holes in them and we'll take a look at those as well. And the uh, one other key characteristic of birds that set them apart is the presence of a beak. And so there are a variety of different types of beaks in various birds depending on what they prey on. So um, you can see some pictures down here of different birds and their different types of beaks and what they're um, structured for. But they have beaks and no teeth. Um, early ancestors of birds had teeth and beaks, but over time they lost their teeth. And so all birds lack teeth, they just have beaks and they must swallow their food whole. And birds are oviparous. So like their non-avian um, uh, reptile ancestors and uh, relatives, they also must lay eggs and undergo internal fertilization to reproduce. Birds have a variety of adaptations that have allowed them the ability to fly. And one of these adaptations is the development of asymmetrical feathers. So as I mentioned before, feathers began in early, some early dinosaurs as a method of insulation. And at that time, these feathers were symmetrical. And that means that they were also not really uh, designed to help with flight. However, over time, um, these feathers started to evolve and become asymmetrical, and they became what we know as the uh, flight-enabling feathers that we see today. Not all feathers are used for flight. There are feathers for a variety of other things, including insulation and sensing their environment, uh, which you can see here as um, 
the feathers here, here, and here are used for different things. Down feathers are for insulation. Some are for waterproofing. Others are for, for sensing their environment. However, um, we're going to spend most of the time talking about this feather here, which is a contour feather. And these are the ones that help facilitate flight. And so a contour feather is composed of a couple different structures. We have the quill. And the quill is the part of the feather that connects the feather to the bird. Um, and it's also hollow in the center. And then from the quill extends the shaft and the shaft is runs down the center of the feather kind of try to highlight it there and then off of the shaft laterally extending are these barbs and so what it looks like um that you can't really see in this picture but it's almost like here's the shaft and then the barbs extend off of the shaft laterally and the barbs are also shown in this picture here and then off of the barbs extending laterally, you have these structures called barbules. And they're showing you the barbules in this picture as well. And the barbules have hooks on them, which allow them to, uh, the barbules from one barb to hook and anchor onto the barbules from another barb. And so that's what they're showing you in this uh, microscope, microscope picture here of these little hooks shown here. Um, off these barbules that are attaching themselves to the barbules from an adjacent uh, different color barbule here from an adjacent um, barb. And so these um, hooks and kind of interconnectedness is why when you take a feather and you run your fingers up the length from, so from the quill up to the top of the shaft, you will find it's really soft. But if you ran your fingers in the opposite direction, um, it's a lot more coarse and you'll find that it's not really easy to separate the different uh, barbs of the feather. And this is because they almost like they're zippered together to make the structure called the vein. And um, if you were to run your fingers in the opposite direction of a feather and cause some of those uh, barbs to disconnect, if you ran your fingers back in the same direction from the quill to the top of the shaft, you'll find that they, uh, the feather will return back to the structure it was. It's almost like a, a zippering motion. So that's uh, kind of the basic structure of a contour feather. Different feathers have slightly different structures, uh, but we won't go into different structures of different types of feathers. Just know that there are different types for different functions. And as I mentioned before, feathers are homologous to the scales of uh, non-avian reptiles. And so they also contain beta keratin. And just as a reminder, beta keratin is a unique feature of reptiles, both avian and non-avian. Um, mammals, we also have keratinized skin, but we don't have beta keratin. We make alpha keratin instead. And so the feathers of uh, a bird do get old and they need to be replaced. And so this uh, shedding of old feathers and replacing uh, with new feathers is called molting. And for most birds or a lot of birds, um, this molting process is symmetrical. And so um, let's say you have a bird and um, on one wing, it needs to uh, remove a feather. It will also remove a old feather from the opposite wing as well. And this allows the bird to remain um, to keep to keep its body weight symmetrical if they were to lose a whole bunch of feathers on one side then they would be unsymmetrical and they wouldn't be able to fly and so when the bird needs to shed they will uh, shed symmetrically and then also the uh, new replacement feather is starts to emerge before the next pair of feathers are lost so just to give an example um got to do poorly drawn bird, but let's say this is the head of the bird and uh, these are the wings of the bird. Gosh, looks more like a bat. But anyway, so let's say we have a uh, feather that needs to be removed here. They will remove a symmetrical feather on this side to, to keep their body weight balanced. But before, let's say we have another feather that needs to be removed, these feathers will replace the lost ones that were circled in blue before we lose the green ones. And this also allows those birds to remain in flight. If they lost all their feathers at once, they would not be able to fly and they would basically be down until they get all their new feathers back. Now there are some birds that do do this. They'll molt and shed all of their feathers at once, but during that time they are left vulnerable because they cannot fly. Um, they're basically grounded until all of their feathers come back. So this could be an effective mechanism for some birds, um, especially if they're able to 
uh, find a secluded place where they can be safe from predators and have lots of prey available to them. But for a lot of different birds, um, this is not really a very viable option because if they lose all of their feathers, they can't fly, they can't find food, they can't escape predators, um, and that leaves them at a great disadvantage. The skeleton of birds are specially designed to allow for flight. For one, they're lightweight, and they're lightweight due to the presence of pneumatized bone. And pneumatized bones are just bones that have a lot more air-filled cavities and holes in them than, let's say, bone that's uh, in mammals that's a lot more dense and filled with cellular material and marrow and things like that. So you can see an example of uh, a cartoon of the nematitized bone here. And from this uh, cross section, you can clearly see that this bone is mostly hollow. It's a lot of empty space. And the bone is kind of held together by these struts that give it a, lot, a little bit more scaffolding and support on the inside. And this allows, this kind of hollow bone structure allows for the skeleton of a bird to be far less heavy or far less dense than the skeleton of a mammal of the same size. Another way that uh, the bird skeleton is designed to minimize weight is through the structure of the skull. So the skull is sturdy, however, it's also kept lightweight through, due to how it's designed and the lack of teeth. So if, they, if birds had uh, jaws like we do that's filled with teeth and things like that, it'd be a lot more heavy. And also the bones of our jaws and, and skull is far thicker and denser than the, the skull of a bird. And so they keep their bones light as well as the lack of teeth to keep them from being so front heavy because if their heads were really heavy, then that would also inhibit their ability to fly. And then just something to note, uh, birds also have a kinetic jaw, uh, similar to what we saw in the uh, non-avian reptiles. There also are some um, other adaptations of the bird skeleton that allows for flight. For one, they, they tend to center a lot of their weight um, in their legs, and this allows them to be aerodynamically stable. So instead of having a lot of weight uh, dorsally or anteriorly, they have a lot of their weight on their ventral side and their posterior where their legs are. And so it's almost like a plane. When the plane takes off, a lot of the, you see it kind of go face up. Birds are the same way. They go face up, keeping their weight um, in their posterior region. They also have elongated uh, and fused bones in their forelimb, which make up the wings, which is also a form of being more lightweight. Instead of having a whole bunch of bones in, to, in their wings to make up the wings, if you fuse these bones together and they're also pneumatized, it allows them to be a lot uh, less heavy. And so you can see those fused bones of the wing here. I'm sure if you've ever had a chicken wing, you're pretty familiar with the structure of these bones as well. And also they have a rigid vertebral column that allows for flight as well. So that uh, instead of having a more flexible vertebrae, which would um, kind of inhibit their ability to fly nearly as well, their vertebral column, which you can see here, different color, is far more kind of structured and, and less flexible. And so this allows them to fly better as well. Even down to uh, the caudal vertebrae in the tail are also not uh, really that flexible either. And then uh, they have a, the, for flight, for flight enabled birds, they have a keeled sternum. And that you can see here. And this keeled sternum allows for um, flight muscle attachment. So there's a sturdy location for these flight muscles. And then when they have strong, powerful flight muscles in combination with the keel, they, when they flap, they're able to generate enough force to provide lift. And um, also they have these uh, fused uh, clavicles called the fer furcula, which you can see here. And this is commonly called the wishbone of, of the bird. And this is the structure that stores energy during wing beats and helps to uh, provide the energy for continued flight. Birds have large pectoral muscles that they use to flap their wings for flight. And there are two main muscles that are involved in this process, the large pectoralis muscle and the slightly smaller supracoracoides muscle. And so what we're going to do is walk through uh, where these muscles are located in the bird using this diagram here. So if 
you were, if a bird was looking directly at you, that's kind of the angle that this picture is at. So here is the keel, this here, of the sternum. And then we have the humerus and the scapula. And if you need to orient yourself kind of what you're looking at, I recommend going to the previous slide and looking at the skeleton of the bird and you can kind of figure out, okay, this is what we're, what we're at. But imagine if you're looking face first at a bird, um, this is kind of the cross section that we're, we're seeing. And so both the um, large pectoralis muscles and the slightly smaller supracorticoides muscles are attached to the keel of the sternum. And so we can uh, follow how this uh, these muscles work in, in conjunction with one another to allow for flight. So when the uh, pectoralis muscles contract, they pull on the humerus, which will depress the wings, which makes really clear sense. Where things get a little different is when we look at the supracoricoides muscles. So they are also attached to the keel, um, rather than being attached to the scapula like you would probably expect them to for them to perform their um, wing elevation function. And so because they are also attached to the keel, they use a kind of rope and pulley system um, to elevate the wings. So you can see that there's the supracoricoides muscle and the tendon of this muscle kind of wraps itself around the humerus to attach to the opposite side of the attachment point of the uh, pectoralis muscle. And so this allows for um, when those muscles contract, they will also pull the tendon and lift the wing, kind of pulling from the opposite side. And so this is a very unique, this rope and pulley um, method is very unique to birds and is how they're able to keep all of their um, weight more on their, their ventral side rather than adding the muscles to their dorsal side, which would uh, inhibit their ability to fly. So having both their muscles located at the keel helps with them uh, balancing and stability during flight. Birds have well-developed brains and sensory organs. And this is important for flight because it allows a bird to sense what's going on in their environment, to process that sensory information, and to respond appropriately. In particular, birds have excellent sense of vision and hearing, which are, you can always obviously imagine why those are important, particularly vision. Um, having a keen sense of vision allows you to be able to see potential predators in your environment as well as prey, but also allows you to more accurately pinpoint where you can land or other obstacles in your environment so you can fly around them. Um, without a good sense of vision, birds would be running into trees and, and missing branches everywhere. Um, they also have a good sense of hearing, which allows them to also identify prey and predator in their environment, but it also allows them to uh, communicate with other birds of the same species because birds tend to be rather vocal and um, they can indicate potential um, mates or potential um, uh, competition for mates. Um, they can also co communicate um, coordinated movements like the coordinated movements of flying or one bird can say, you know, say to other birds, hey, there's a predator and then they can all coordinate the um, taking to the sky so they can avoid a predator. And they can also hear various other aspects of their environment. Uh, let's say a bird wants to land near a river, they can hear the rushing water of the river. So these uh, keen senses are really important for flight as well as other um, complex behaviors of birds. And then they also have these well-developed brains that are able to take the information that they get from their sensory organs and process it and respond appropriately. So birds have a rather large optic lobe that processes sensory information from uh, their eyes, from vision, um, and allows them to respond appropriately. They also have enlarged cerebellums and cerebrums that coordinate um, complex movements such as flight. So without these uh, enlarged regions of the brain, the birds wouldn't be able to um, more wouldn't be able to sense what's going on in their environment as well as they do, and they wouldn't be able to coordinate um, complex behaviors such as flight or um, like social behaviors like communication and mating rituals and things like that. So now that we talked about the various aspects of birds that allow for flight, let's talk about other elements of their anatomy and physiology. We'll begin with digestion. And so digestion begins with ingestion, the bringing in of food into the body. And for this, birds have beaks. And like we talked about before, birds have beaks but lack teeth, unlike their uh, ancestors that had beaks and teeth. 
And because they modern day birds lack teeth, they must ingest large pieces of food or ingest their food whole. So this, this can be problematic if they don't have a, a way of breaking that large food pieces down into smaller uh, pieces. But they do, and we'll talk about that in a second. So the food then moves from the mouth down the esophagus to a structure called the crop. And the crop is like the holding tank for the food. Um, the food will stay in the crop until it's ready to be moved through the rest of the digestive tract. The crop is also where food is stored for birds to feed their young. So they'll, let's say, eat a worm and store it in the crop and then go to their nests, regurgitate that worm at the nests to feed their young. So let's say this, in our example, this bird is not looking to feed its young, it's looking to eat. Um, the food will then move from the crop into the stomach. And the stomach is composed of two parts. We have the proventriculus, which is located here, and it's responsible for secreting the digestive juices and enzymes to help break down the food. And then the second part of the stomach is the gizzard. And the gizzard is where the food will actually be broken down into smaller and smaller pieces. The gizzard functions similar to teeth for mastication. And so what will happen is the food moves from the crop through the proventriculus to the gizzard. And once in the gizzard, the food um, and digestive juices will meet up with small particulates, um, like small pebbles or sand or, or soil um, and, and things like that, which will help to break down the food. So once all of that stuff meets up in the gizzard, the gizzard is very muscular um, and it will start to contract and expand, extract and expand. And as it's contracting, all this uh, food and juices and like little pebbles are mixing around and that helps to grind the food and into smaller and smaller pieces. So that's why the gizzard is, works very similar to like your um, teeth, your molars. And then from here, once the food is broken down um, enough, then it will be moved to the small intestine. And then from the small intestine, a lot of nutrients will be absorbed, and then uh, the food will move to the large intestine. Now, for many birds, they have a structure between the small intestine and the large intestine called cecae, and they have two paired cecae, well, not two paired cecae, they have two cecae, which are in pairs. Um, and these cecae act as fermentation chambers for uh, cellulose in any of the undigestible plant material. So the um, undigested fiber will be moved from the small intestine into the cecae where it will meet up with various microbes that will ferment the cellulose and then allow for um, that fermented product to then empty into the large intestine where the nutrients will be absorbed. And so let's say that that happens, we got our fermented product, then moves to the large intestine, and from the large intestine, the digestive tract um, ends at the rectum, which will then empty out into a structure called the cloaca. And the cloaca is a uh, similar structure as to what we see in non-avian reptiles, and it's a, a common pore, common exit point for both for the uh, excretory system and reproductive system. So the genital ducts, the ureters, and the rectum all end in this common pore and um, any waste products will be removed from the body via the rectum. So the key, um, the key structures that are unique to birds in their digestive tract is the crop, the proventriculus, and the gizzard. We won't talk in a lot of detail about the circulatory systems of birds, but I did want you to know that birds do have a four-chambered heart, like their close relatives, the crocodilians. And um, also mammals have a four-chambered heart, but the four-chambered heart in mammals and in birds are analogous to one another. They are not uh, homologs. And then also birds have uh, nucleated biconvex erythrocytes. And this is different from what we see in mammals because mammals we have enucleated, so no nucleus, um, biconcave erythrocytes. So um, they perform similar functions, but they're very different in structure. The erythrocytes of birds have a nucleus and they're convex. And then the, um, the uh, sorry, the erythrocytes of mammals do not have a nucleus and they're concave. The reproductive uh, cycle of birds is somewhat very similar to the reproductive system of reptiles, non-avian reptiles, um, where, but there are some a little bit differences. So the um, birds 
they begin reproduction by meeting up their cloacas. So the cloaca of a male bird will meet up with the cloaca of a female bird, and um, the sperm from the males will travel through the cloacas to the reproductive tract of the females. Now, once the sperm has entered the oviduct of the female, it can survive in there for a long time, like several days, um, even sometimes weeks. So the sperm will hang out in the oviduct waiting to meet up with an egg. And on the female side of things, the uh, females will release a ovum or an egg from their ovaries to travel down the oviduct. And as it's traveling down the oviduct, it will meet up with sperm and fertilization will occur. As the egg continues, well, the now fertilized egg continues to travel down the oviduct, a couple other components will be added due to secretions from various glands in the oviduct. So the albumin will be added as well as the shell membrane, um, the shell itself, and shell pigments will be all added. And then eventually the um, egg will meet up at the uh, the your oh my gosh uterus sorry and then from the uterus it will be expelled out of the body via the cloaca and you we all know what eggs look like so this is also what we talked about before in non-avian reptiles why you need fertilization to be internal um, because once that shell is put on you won't be able to get the fertilization to occur so fertilization has to occur early in the uh, oviduct rather than later because once it travels further down, the shell is added and the sperm will not be able to fertilize the egg. The last thing I wanna talk about for birds is how they undergo respiration. And the respiratory system of birds is very unique. It's different from what we've talked about in amphibians and in non-avian reptiles. And it's also very different from what we see in mammals. The respiratory uh, tract or uh, respiratory system of birds is efficient and optimized for a high metabolic demand. Um, for birds that are flying, you can imagine how much energy that requires. But even for birds that don't fly, those that are swimming or running, it has a lot more uh, metabolic demand than what we see in non-avian reptiles that are generally a little bit more immobile in nature. And so there are a couple different structures that are unique to birds that we don't see in, um, in reptile, non-avian reptiles, or in mammals. One of these is the presence of something called parabronchi. And the parabronchi make up the lungs of birds. And they're very different from uh, uh, in structure from the alveoli that we see in mammals. So birds don't have alveoli. Instead, they have the parabronchi. Now, alveoli, alveoli or alveoli and parabronchi, they uh, perform similar functions, but they're structurally a bit different. So alveoli are, um, as you might be familiar with in your other classes, these kind of dead-end structures in the lungs where air will enter into these structures and they're highly vascularized and that's where gas exchange will occur. And then um, once you exhale, the uh, air will then be removed from the alveoli back into the main portion of the lungs and then out of the body. For these parabronchi, instead of having this kind of bi-directional movement um, because there's a dead end to the alveoli, for the parabronchi, air moves straight through. So it's almost more like a tube than it is a kind of dead end structure. And so uh, this diagram down here is attempting to kind of exhibit kind of what the parabronchi look like. And you can see from that picture compared to this rudimentary picture I drew of alveoli, they're uh, very different in structure. Another key difference for uh, birds that we don't see in mammals or in uh, non-avian reptiles are these nine air sacs. And um, I'm not gonna draw a circle around them, but they're pointing to all these kind of white structures are the air sacs. And they have posterior air sacs, which are closer to their tail, and anterior air sacs, which are closer to the head. And these air sacs are important for um, how birds undergo respiration. So the, the air movement in the bird respiratory tract is unidirectional, unidirectional and it's continuous. And this allows for new air to be constantly being brought into the respiratory system so that they can extract as much oxygen as they possibly can so they can have a lot more uh, cellular metabolism. So how this process works is a bird will inhale and once they inhale, air is brought into the respiratory system 
and is moved to these posterior air sacs. And uh, that's kind of what they're showing you, like these air sacs here. And all these air sacs are attached to the lungs. So once the bird exhales, the air will move from the posterior air sac, air sac into the lungs. And the lungs, as we mentioned before, are composed of these parabronchi and they're highly vascularized. So this is where gas exchange will occur. And from the, um, the uh, sorry, from the parabronchi, the air will then move to an anterior air sac once the bird inhales again. So the um, bird inhales, the air moves to an anterior air sac, and then once the bird exhales again, the air will be moved from the anterior air sac through the, the trachea and then out of the body. So just as a recap, bird inhales, air is moved from the environment through the trachea into a posterior air sac. Bird exhales, the air moves from the posterior air sac into the parabronchi. Bird inhales, air moves from the parabronchi where gas exchange occurred to an anterior air sac. And then bird exhales and the uh, air will move from an anterior air sac through uh, back out the trachea and into the environment. So this means that air to get through the entire respiratory tract of a bird must go uh, must requ requires two respiratory cycles. So they have to inhale, exhale twice for air that's brought into the respiratory tract to move through the respiratory tract and then removed um, via the final or second exhale. And this is why I said that the air movement is continuous. There's never a time like in mammals how we inhale and then exhale. There is a gap in the uh, the movement of air through our bodies, right? You inhale, there's a gap, exhale. But for them, they inhale, exhale, no matter what, air is constantly still moving through the respiratory tract. I just didn't feel right ending the semester without even touching anything about mammals. So we won't go into detail on mammals. Um, this is literally the only slide that we'll cover, but I did wanna just cover the basics of mammals and what makes us distinct or sets us apart from other groups of vertebrates. If you wanna know more about mammals, um, please see the mammal section of your textbook or various other resources that are out there online um, in other books, et cetera. So some examples of mammals include whales, chimps, dogs, moles, humans, cats, uh, beavers, the list goes on and on and on. Um, you can probably think of some mammals off the top of your head faster than almost any other animal because we are mammals and generally you're most familiar with what you're, re you're closely related to. Um, and so there are a variety of mammals out there in all the different uh, ecosystems around the planet. Uh, we have a lot of adaptations that allow us to live in areas where other animals cannot. Um, for one, we're endothermic like birds. So that allows us to live in more cold environments where like non-avian reptiles or amphibians uh, would not be able to survive. Um, but there are two groups of mammals. We have our monotremes and um, these are the mammals that lay eggs. An example, can be seen down here. This cute little guy is an echidna. And instead of uh, giving birth to live young, the echidna will lay eggs, which will then hatch. And then we have our therians. And therians, uh, the group consists of placentals, which uh, we exchange nutrients between the mother and the fetus using a placenta. And obviously cows, humans, we are examples of placentals. And then the marsupials. And the marsupials are, um, they give birth to live young as well, but their young are uh, very undeveloped. And so the young will travel from the reproductive tract to a nipple in the pouch where they'll not latch onto that nipple. And that's where they will stay for several weeks and months um, to further undergo development. And so the uh, marsupials and placentals are the therians and then the monotremes are uh, their own kind of separate group and they lay eggs. As I mentioned before, mammals are endothermic, so we uh, regulate our body temperature internally, which gives us a lot of advantages when it comes to uh, be able to uh, survive in various environments. 
We also have hair, which is one of the big things about mammals that sets us apart from other groups. Um, we can use hair for a variety of things. Mostly we use it obviously for insulation. We can also use hair for concealment, for signaling, for waterproofing, for buoyancy, for sensing our environment. Uh, the list goes on and on and on. There are a variety of uses for hair and all mammals have hair. Uh, there are no other animals on the, the planet that have, well, no other groups of animals on the planet that have hair. Mammals have a diaphragm that we use for respiration. So as I talked about before, um, all amniotes use rib ventilation and they have to either lower their liver or their diaphragm posteriorly to expand the chest cavity. In mammals, what we do is we uh, move our diaphragm. In non-avian reptiles, they uh, will move their liver. But for us, we have a diaphragm, which is unique to mammals. No other um, animal on the planet has a diaphragm. And you can see how the uh, diaphragm plays a role in um, respiration in this, this picture here. I think it does a really good job of showing that. Mammals also have mammary glands, which is unique to us. Um, we produce mucus in the form of milk to feed our young. And um, all, um, well, yeah, all mammals can do this to some degree. Um, mammals have well-developed brains and sensory organs. This allows us to be very good predators, um, as well as to escape from predators in the case of prey. Um, we have a unique structure of our brain called the cerebral neocortex, which surrounds the brain that is seen in no other group of vertebrates. And then we also have a more complex middle ear than all other vertebrates. Uh, we didn't really talk about the ear structure of other vertebrate groups in a lot of detail, but for most other vertebrates, they either don't have any uh, inner ear bones like we see in fish. They just use vibrations that go through their swim bladder to um, kind of hear in their environment, or some have one bone or uh, two bones that make up their, their middle ear. But for mammals, we have three bones or three ossicles that uh, make up the middle ear, the incus, the stapes, and the ma malleus. And um, you can see the structure of these if you uh, look them up online. But they're used to amplify sound so that we can better detect things that are happening in our environment. Mammals um, are amniotes like birds and uh, non-avian reptiles. So reptiles and mammals are amniotes. And our, um, I use, include this picture here to show you, it's an example of a placental um, mammal, but the um, amniotic egg in mammals is a little bit different than what we see in reptiles, but it's basically the same thing. Um, you can see the allantois here, which is shown in yellow. Um, you can see the amnion, which is surrounding the embryo in that fluid filled sac. Um, we have the chorion here as well. Um, the reason why I say it's a little bit different is because we don't, uh, unless it's a monotreme, we don't have a shell on the outside. Instead, it's just kind of um, tissue that surrounds the fetus. But we as mammals are amniotes, so we do have all of those shared characteristics that we talked about of all amniotes when we, dis when we discussed that in the non-avian reptiles lecture. And the skull of uh, mammals is synapsid. So we talked about how mammals and reptiles, both uh, groups originated from an anapsid ancestor, but then there was a branching and the um, reptiles developed from a diapsid shared ancestor, whereas the mammals, we uh, descended from a shared ancestor that was a synapsid. So they have one opening behind the orbit rather than two. And uh, with that said, that's pretty much all the things that I really wanted to cover about mammals. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. If you want to know more about mammals, uh, these characteristics and others, please see your textbook or um, various other resources online. Okay, with that said, that, is, that concludes our crash course on uh, subphylum vertebrata. I hope you've enjoyed it. I know it's a lot of information. But we didn't go into a whole bunch of detail on a lot of things because just wanted you to be familiar with some key details of each group rather than um, everything in super depth because we just don't really have that much time. Alrighty, with that said, I hope you enjoyed this semester and um, I will see you at the end of the semester for the exam four and the final exam. Bye.